I think one of the things that was necessary was to kind of start collecting individuals that I'm around, that I sit with, that I learn with, to kind of bring them into some of my spaces and put them in a situation where individuals that I work with, individuals that look up to me, have an opportunity to kind of see my circle. Having Mohammed in, specifically today, you know, serves the purpose of giving my students an opportunity to see a journey and a different journey. Predominantly, it's always black men in our communities. But I also have a following of a lot of Asian people as well. And I think it's important for them to see that individuals from their community have also raised up in the ranks from our communities and now, you know, reached the highest mark, which is the PhD. I just want to know more. I want to know him a little bit more than what I know him, if that makes sense. We always document or we always hear of documents of individuals that are doing negative in our community, but not oftentimes the positive. So this is a platform um, of this series where I want to get individuals like um, Dr. Rahman to come in and you know show his expertise and you know he's charismatic, he's, he's funny, um, and I need my students to see. Yo, first of all, I just say, Mo, thanks for coming, man. You're welcome. You know what, it's, it's mad because I've always wanted to have you on the platform. And it, you know what's strange? I'll tell you what's real strange. It's a bit of a confession as well. Because when I did my MA, I didn't remember <laughs> that you was a part of the group. Yeah. The first time I seen you, actually, I seen you a couple of occasions, I think, when we were going to pray. That's right. But at that point, I still didn't know who you was, if that makes sense. And then it was at, no, a brother from the community hollered at me and must have said, who is this <laughs> doctor? Who is this, is this Mohammed guy? And I was kind of like, Mohammed, I don't know Mohammed. Phoned a couple of people and I was like, of course you know him, he's my man that was from the class. And I was like, nah. And then when I seen a picture, I'm like, yeah, it's my man. And you have to forgive me for that one. That's not a problem. But at the same time, you know what? After that point, I started to see you consistently in the community, doing things with families that were affected by violence and whatnot and started to follow you a little bit more. And I think that maybe probably two summers ago, I would say that's when the bond probably started even Definitely. more so compared to before when we knew each other but didn't really know each other. Does yeah. that make sense? And for me, it's just been kind of a blessing and an interest to see your journey thus far because one of the things that I'm trying to do here is to inspire young people, students that come from communities that we've come from and think to our, themselves that, you know what? Education ain't for them. And I always say that education might not be the only tool, but it's definitely a tool that's worked for people like us. So my bringing you here today is for that purpose. And more so, I want to learn about you. Like, who's, who are you? Who is Mo? Who is, who is my having now, Dr. Ra? Who are you? <laughs> to like, just kind of just like give the people just one an understanding of who you are. Quick. I'm a academic criminologist from Birmingham State University. I lecture in criminology. I've been lecturing since 2013. Uh, so when we finished the Masters, September 2013, I joined the criminology team at BCU and I've been teaching there ever since. So I teach on an array of modules and alongside my teaching, I also conduct research and my PhD level research was focusing on organised crime and homicide within uh, the, the West Midlands. So that was a three year ethnographic study and that's what's made me a doctorate in philosophy. Um, in terms of myself, I think my story in many ways as I've got to know myself a bit more and reflect in many ways over the years, I've realised that some of the things that I've done are unique. Uh, so I've recently been told that I'm the first British Bangladeshi criminologist that's and for days. me, that's a big thing. <laughs> that's, a big yes, sir. That's, a, that's a big thing for me in, in, in many ways because the Bangladeshi community um, in many ways um, all, over the years I've realised are subordinate within the Asian constituency so they're seen more lower than the Indian community, the Pakistani community and so on and so forth. So for me to know the fact that I'm the first um, British Bangladeshi criminologist um, hopefully in the future that can motivate mm -hmm. and, uh, and inspire other individuals to take the path. And you know what? It's real because why that's real for me is because that inspires me alone. You know, one of the things that I always talk about is from the ends where I grew up, mm. come up. One of the things that a lot of 
young people don't see. And elders within the community, as many of us shining. Yes. And I think people like us have definitely, definitely have a role to play in making sure that in our communities that we're seen, we're heard, and we're visible. Now, I have to say that, you know, with people like Dr. Martin Glenn and yourself and others, you know, you guys have inspired me, and that's why I'm signing up for my PhD now. And I have to thank you on camera for that, because I see the grind and I see the importance of it. Right. You know, even for me, I was always hiding away behind my dyslexia. I did it before my master's degree. I went through it. Yeah, I went through the struggle. I did it. And, you know, I've got to a position now where I'm probably one of the leading people in the country at the things that I do around youth and gang violence. And I think one of the things that, for me, all I need to do is do that last step. Yeah. And I need to, to show my community that I can do it. And it's not just for the community. You know, I've got kids and they need to be able to see that, you know what, you don't have to be a statistic because we know the stereotypes that's given to predominantly young black males within our community. Asian males now, with all the issues around terrorism, Islamophobia and all of that other stuff that's going on now. But more importantly, in my community, it needs to be recognised that, you know, you can come from the ends. Yeah. And you know what, you can get a degree. So what I want to know about is what's your background? So you've given me the academic stuff now. Don't want to know about that no more. I want to know who's Mo, where's Mo come from and where's Mo? What were the struggles that Mo got to to today? I think um, the struggles, the backstory, um, the, my development has been integral for obviously my academic side of life. But I was born in the early 90s. Um, I come from a small family, so. Um, what area? I'm from Handsworth, um, Birmingham. So I, I, I was born in La Salle's actually. And then for the first few years, I actually lived in London for, um, from, from 1990 to 93. My granddad died in a car accident when I was four months old. So the family moved down to London from where my, where my dad started working. Yeah. Uh, and then we came back and we settled in Handsworth. We settled in Handsworth in mid-1990. And during that time, mid-1990, in terms of Handsworth, and crime, it was a, a, a very, very strong combination. You know, uh, the gangland scene was active, it was lucrative, it was expansive, and it was exponentially violent. Mm. Uh, it's actually the stronghold of one of the biggest gangs uh, and organized crime groups in the West Midlands, if not in the country during that time. So, so it, was, it was difficult, um, me being the only child I'm still the only child. Me being the only child at that time is difficult because I never had that kind of defense mechanism. I never had that older brother that was looking out for me or, or that older cousin that was looking out for me. So some of the stuff that I had to do at a young age and experience and witness, mm. you know, they were traumatic. Uh, uh, some of them were humiliating, but it's made me who I am in many ways. So from Handsworth, I moved to Winston Green, uh, which is the neighboring area. And it's no better in Winston Green when it comes to social economic deprivation, crime, delinquent behavior. It's actually, in many ways, uh, woven into the fabric mm. of those roads and those areas. So I was living at, uh, in a house that was literally a few minutes away from Winston Green Prison. Mm -hmm. you know, and I remember back in 2001 when we moved there, uh, some key things happened. Um, you know, globally, we had 9-11. So it was difficult to be a Muslim at that time. Yeah. Um, um, it's become far more difficult now. But during that time, you know, it was the start of what's ongoing at the moment and um, also during that time I remember I think we were in the first few weeks of living in Winston Green um, a, terraced, a terraced house uh, on a small road and I just heard consistent fireworks or I thought it was fireworks the next day I realised it was actually a crime scene a Chinese uh, individual who was living at a property adjacent to my house was shot dead mm -hmm. and um, later on I found out that mm -hmm. it was actually an automatic sort of machine gun so it's them kind of things that I had to accept from a young age the mm -hmm. fact that violence was around the corner but also had to defend myself knowing the fact that the defence mechanisms mm -hmm. that I have are very weak. Because you used to do martial arts, didn't you? Yeah, I, did, I yeah, used yeah, to do yeah. martial arts, and I think martial arts in many ways is something that I never enjoyed mm. doing, but I had to do in order for me to protect myself in many yeah, ways. Yeah. Mm. So uh, it wasn't nothing to do with you know, hyper-masculine behaviour or anything, it was actually the fact that I need to do something in order that's going to protect me. I went to a school, George Dixon, uh, international school, which is GDA. It's funny, I was at the school around the corner, um, Cardinal Newman. Cardinal Newman. Yeah, yeah, before it got closed down. So, so yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So my school was on the verge of closing down. Mm. You know, over the years, it's gone downhill. I don't know how it is now, but back once upon a time, it was a grammar school. Uh, but when I went there, it was just a normal um, uh, comprehensive school. 
and it was rough. It was a rough and tough school, uh, many fights, um, you know, fights that um, in hindsight when I look back and I reflect, I think to myself, oh, could I have got myself out of that fight? No. It was the case of actually, no, you need to get yourself into that fight in order for you to defend and prove yourself and so on and so forth. And I remember I left school with a few GCSEs, but I was one of the fortunate ones because my school year actually had a GCSE pass rate of 14%. Oh, wow. So if you think about it, out of 200 yeah, yeah, yeah. of us, only 30-something got mm, their GCSEs. Yeah, yeah. And that funneled down mm. in college later on where I realised only a few of us got our college degrees, mm. uh, co college qualifications, and then I moved on to university. Yeah, but for the most part, my PhD in many ways, why I investigated, how I went about investigating it was because of my insider positionality. I was able to actually accept and I think that's one of the things that we don't mm. tend to do is accept our identity. Mm. In many ways, you've spoken about this. The reason why you're doing your PhD is because you've accepted your identity in society and you know what to do with it. You've seen the struggles, you've seen the trials and tribulations. And, you know, it's, it's what, what you do with them, which is mm. important as opposed to mm. anything else. So what do you want to be your legacy? My legacy is simple. I think I mentioned uh, recently um, to some senior members of staff at my workplaces, I want to dominate my craft. I want to become not only a leading figure in criminology in the country, but I want to become an internationally renowned global mm. criminologist. Um, I think if I'm leaving something behind, it's going to be uh, bits of knowledge. I think knowledge mm. is important and making sense of knowledge is equally important. We've got final year students that are studying for their bachelor's degree, but if you ask them the question, what is knowledge? they won't be able yeah, to give your answer yeah, because it's difficult yeah, yeah, for them yeah. to actually comprehend yeah. and understand yeah. what knowledge is. So my thing is simple. Uh, it actually bounces off my faith, Islam as well, which is to acquire knowledge and impart it to the people. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And how I go, go about doing that is obviously, you know, up to individuals like you that are, you know, doing these shows and doing these talks and also through my own work, uh, mm -hmm. teaching and publications. That's real. Finally, I'm glad that I got you here, Memo. <laughs> you know, Thank I'm you very much. for that. All right. Pleasure. Man.